Greetings, geologists, and we're here today to talk about the Cambrian period, which marks the journey that we're going to start at the Paleozoic era. There are seven geologic periods for the Paleozoic era in North America. If you look at your time scale, you're going to notice that you could count Carboniferous as one, so you would have a total of six. You can do that if you're over in Europe, but not in North America, because we separate out the Carboniferous from Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, respectively. So each of the seven periods in the Paleozoic has an age of name that's associated with them simply because something was famous about that time frame. I'm not saying that they weren't famous throughout other periods. For instance, trilobites are found in all seven of the Paleozoic periods. But why are they so important to the Cambrian? Well, let's talk about that. We have over 15,000 species of trilobites identified, described in the rock record, of which I might add all 15,000 plus are extinct, no longer with us. About 75% of them went extinct at the end of the Cambrian period, making them exceptional index fossils for the Cambrian period. They're not the only animals that arrived during the Cambrian, and as a matter of fact, they're just one of many that appeared. And we'll get to that shortly. So let's talk about some of the key things about the Cambrian period and how it even starts the honor of being the first period of the Phanerozoic Eon. So where is that dividing line between Precambrian, Ediacaran, and Cambrian rocks that start right here? So the Cambrian is divided into three parts, the lower, the middle, and the upper, known as the late uh, Cambrian. As I've mentioned in prior discussions, if we're talking about early or lower, that means the same thing for a period. It means the beginning, middle, self-explanatory, and upper or late mean the same thing. So they're the end of a period. So in this case, the Cambrian period begins at 542 million years ago. It wasn't always set at that time frame. It was set at a different marker because the very first occurrence of Shelley animals is where the initial marker of the Cambrian period used to be. But in the 1970s, fossils of uh, sponge spicules, brachiopods, and even mollusks were discovered that actually scooted back the initial location of where that particular time frame should be. So a distinctive group of these fossils is going to be important uh, for where we put that marker. That's going to get challenged again when the official setting of 542 million years ago occurred by the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Where is that dividing line and why is 542 the magic number? It has to do with the worm burrows you see to the right there. These particular worm burrows are trace fossils, but they actually mark the very bottom of the Cambrian period now at 542 million years ago. So this period will extend from that 542 million all the way up until 488 million years ago. For testing purposes, you're going to need to know the beginning and the ends of each period and how long that they last in terms of millions of years. That's very easy to figure out when you're taking your test, if you just know the, the finish date of each period, you know the start date of the one in between. So make sure you know what those are because the dividing markers for each period is important. While the time scale may actually change the beginning and the end of each period, the basic time frame will stay the same. What happens in each period is pretty much the same. And so we're looking for a chronology of events that happen throughout geologic time and lots will be happening in a very short, brief period of time as we go through the Paleozoic. One of the first things we need to recognize when we're doing this process of each period is understanding that there's basically two different sets of things we look at in each of these periods. First is we look at paleogeographic information. What does that mean? That means we look at the basic orientation and location of the continental bodies that were present at that time. So some of the continents aren't going to be recognizable to you as what you know continents today. They have changed their location dramatically from where they were back, let's say, during Cambrian time frame. 
That's due to plate tectonics. What could cause that? Things like mid-oceanic ridges, rifting. So we get these processes that either move crust and bang it into continents, which would be where an MOR pushes in its oceanic crust against a continent, causing a subduction zone, or we get rifting that tears a continent apart. Either case, we can have this constant tug of war where continents are changing their shape and relocating as plates are drifting across the globe over the mantle. So there are six ba major basic continents that existed during the Paleozoic, or at the beginning of the Paleozoic, should I say. They're the leftovers from Rodinia, which actually broke into a second supercontinent, if you read your chapter in Precambrian. And these are the six major components that are left. Don't underestimate that there will be dozens of microcontinents, microplates. We still have microplates today. Let me give you an example. Juan de Fuca would be a microplate, and that sits right by Washington State and Oregon in Northern California. Well, that microplate is extremely important to the dynamics of what's going on, geologically speaking, in that region, including volcanoes like Mount St. Helens. So don't underestimate the power of each of the microplates that are discussed sporadically throughout the semester. I'm not going to ask that you know how to spell all these continents. What I'm asking is that you're going to know the basic six and that you're going to recognize that they belong together as the major continents that will assume different names throughout geologic time. Let's focus on two of them in particular that will become the two major groups of clusters of continents by the end of the Paleozoic. So that would be Gondwana land, which is Gondwana for short, and Laurasia which is also referred to as Laurentia. So Laurentia, let's start there first. That's the modern day North America, Greenland, uh, Northwestern Ireland, and Scotland. Not too hard to buy off on those, but when you take a look at Gondwana, let's look at the surprises there. It's not just one, there's gonna be two major surprises, maybe three. So not hard to buy off on Africa, Antarctica, and Australia, Madagascar, even parts of the Middle East you can buy off on. But Florida, really? India, really? Southern Europe, hmm, not so sure about these things, right? So that means there's a remarkable story of how did these parts of these places, these continents, and Florida in particular, how did it get all the way to North America? When did this happen? So these stories are part of what make historical so fascinating is because these sequence of events occur and the plates merge together and then they split apart. So that's the theme of the Paleozoic is bringing all the continents together to make Pangaea by the end of the Permian. So starting by the Triassic, certainly by the end of the Triassic into the Jurassic, the theme is just the opposite, split them all apart. So you can see there's a theme throughout geologic past. If you bring a supercontinent together, you split it back up. You bring it together, you split it back up apart. That is where we're headed with this. So understand that each period will have two segments that we cover, which is the paleogeographic information, aka where are the continents located at that time, and number two, what were the life forms of that time frame. So during the paleogeographic information, we'll likely talk about any applicable orogenies, which are mountain building events that may occur. We'll talk about important rifting. We'll talk about important uh, landscapes that might have existed back at that time. So we'll get started with that with the Cambrian period. So paleogeographic map looks like this. They come in a lot of different shapes, fashions, and forms, but you can basically see it shows you what the various different uh, types of material were that were being deposited at that time frame. To be clear, let's take a look. This is a really important part of one of the labs that you did in the sloth sequence was looking at where the transcontinental arch is located and then the uh, Canadian shield. So all this kind of yellow stuff was exposed continent. This material right here, the lighter colored greeny material, that's going to be your shallow continental shelf, and this is ideal for creating uh, stuff like limestone, especially if you're out in this area, way away from the coastline. So right around this section, you should have thick sandstones. 
If you get into the darker blues, you're going to be into the deep water marine sediments such as shale. So something to note about the Cambrian period. The Cambrian period had no mountain building. It was completely passive. So if you think back to passive versus active terms, passive means that there is no plate colliding or rifting occurring. So we have absolutely passive shelves from the southern, western, and eastern margin of the continents. So that means the sea level can come in and invade the continent and will lay down thick sequences of marine strata, which is interesting because we have a big chunk of it that will not get deposition during that time frame, which of course is this section right here, the Canadian Shield and the Transcontinental Arch. Those areas stay above sea level and are extremely weathered and eroded down. So we have a major unconformity that exists in the middle of the continent from the Sauk sequence. So at the end of the Precambrian, during the Neo-Proterozoic, Snowball Earth began to melt. Why did it melt? It started to melt because of rifting, rifting a part of Laurentia and Gondwana land. And rifting is going to produce lots of volcanic gases and volcanism and those gases are going to change the chemistry of the atmosphere in the ocean. It's going to lead to an atmospheric warming because you'll get more CO2, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And we also had some movement of continents towards the equator. As this rifting occurs, a brand new ocean called the Iapetus Ocean the Iapetus Ocean is going to play an instrumental role in what happens, especially as we close it up right in this section as this landmass will end up joining with Laurentia. So this is incredible change because now that we have distance between the continents, we're going to have better oceanic circulation, which moves warmer ocean currents throughout the world, which naturally will also control climate and make it a warmer, more equitable climate. What does this mean for life on Earth? Well, if we're flooding the continents for the first time, wow, these are going to be nice shallow marine continental shelves. And since so much of our animals live in shallow marine continental shelves, we just made premium real estate for life to flourish. So that will lead us into a discussion a little later about uh, the Cambrian explosion. What was going on with the seas during the Cambrian? So this is part of the paleogeographic discussion of every period. In this case, we began seeing the transgressive phase of the Salk sequence. Well, the Salk begins in the Neo-Proterozoic with the melting of Snowball Earth. The major transgressive sequence portion of it really happens during the Cambrian period. So until we had this time, our continents were fully exposed available to be weathered. There are no plants on land to anchor anything to the ground. So the ground is subjected to high concentrations of weathering and erosion. With the passive shelves that we have on all sides of our continent, eastern, western, and southern, the sock sequence can invade what we call the North American craton and lead a massive entry into the the middle of the continent. So let's take a look at how far it invaded into our continent. It invaded into the areas where we're going to have this mass that we know of called the Canadian Shield and then these islands that make up a trail all the way from the Great Lakes down to New Mexico called the Transcontinental Arch. So by the middle Cambrian, the transgressive phase of the Salk had been in full-fledged, and empiric seas are encroaching in on the ocean onto the continent. So the ocean had been out here, and now it's starting to work its way into the middle of the continent. So as you start to look at this, we're going to be kind of focusing in this area right here, talking about the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Well, the Grand Canyon has a perfect rock record of this Salk transition has a perfect rock record of the salt transgression and it leaves behind a, a series of these rock layers starting with the shoreline to the lagoonal environment all the way to the far away from a terrigenous input meaning far away from a detrital source of material that makes carbonate rock known as limestone. 
So what is this continental arch, this transcontinental arch that we keep referring to? It's a cluster of about five islands, and that number sporadically changes throughout the early Paleozoic that are exposed very large land masses. Of course, the Canadian Shield stays fully exposed during the Cambrian, and again, there are no plants, so you have to assume that the amount of erosion and weathering would be significant any of the locations where this transcontinental arch and shield existed. So you should find extreme amounts of sand deposits around these areas. Not only would they be the shoreline beaches, but they'd also be the detrital material that washes off from this continental shield and the transcontinental arch that are going to lay down thick deposits of sand. The further you get away from the Canadian Shield, the less detrital input that you'll have into the rock layers. So you'll end up with some really gorgeous carbonate limestones and facies out here, and then you're going to end up in the deep water shales and rocks of that nature way out where the original ocean used to be. Again, there were no vascular plants. We'll talk more about vascular and non-vascular plants in the Ordovician. So we don't even have any plants during the Cambrian. That's the message right there. So the land was exposed. If it was, there was no chance to anchor it down. So what freshly gets laid down during the Cambrian, if there's no plants until the Ordovician and really towards a specific part of the Ordovician, we're going to erase a lot of what gets laid down during the Cambrian period because of erosion. So anything that is exposed has the potential to be highly weathered, which is why we have such a gigantic unconformity that's so wide for the sock uh, sequence between the end of the sock and the beginning of the tippy canoe. What types of rocks would you expect to be finding during the Cambrian period being deposited? Right around the transcontinental arch and the Canadian Shield thick sequences of shales uh, that are in the lagoons that are detrital material and sand zones right adjacent to those continental masses. But the farther you get away from them, where the detrital input has dropped out, you're going to start forming large-scale carbonate deposition. This is important because animals have very specific habitats that they live in. Some like the sandy and muddy bottoms. Some do not. So depending on what they need for survival di dictates where they're going to live and ultimately probably where we'll find their fossils. And that's how we use fossils for biostratigraphy. So some of the clues that there were carbonate rocks uh, in geologic past in the Cambrian are the following. We have rocks that have stromatolites. These are stromatolite fossils right here. We have some that are bioclastic, which would be these right here. This is an oolitic texture that's in limestone. We find that consistently in the carbonate rocks, indicating shallow marine depositional environments. So the ocean was not that deep that was on the continent itself. If you're on the edges that would have already been flooded prior to the beginning of the salt sequence, then they're going to be producing things like deep water shales. But when we're looking at a place like Arizona, not the case. They were producing shallow marine environmental conditions. So again, let's see if you can figure out where the rocks would be. I want you to look at the diagram and kind of trace with your finger where would the sandstone be that you'd expect to find. Obviously, as the shoreline's coming in, but just looking at this diagram, what would you say would be the thickest areas that you would find sandstones? If you answered around the Canadian Shield perimeter, and around these five little islands right here called the transcontinental arch, you are correct. So this area that's way away, that's off where the oceans would be today, that is going to be the deep water material. And then the stuff that's far away from the terrigenous input but not off the continent would be producing carbonate types of rocks. It's important that you take time to digest that and understand that concept because it's a theme throughout the entire rest of the semester. So you have to look at each of these paleogeographic maps and understand that the sea has come in, it's come out. It doesn't matter what colors we make these on a map, the reality is the same. The water was on these continents and it left a marker behind in the form of a rock record. That includes, in most cases, fossils. 
So we can use those as markers to help us understand when a period started and when it finished. Let's talk about how great the Grand Canyon shows the Cambrian sequence of rocks. It has very much three well-exposed rock layers. So some people always ask, well, where's the siltstone? Because, you know, you got limestone, you got shale, siltstone, then sandstones, the four majors that build on top of each other as the perfect sea level rises. Well, we don't have the siltstone in the Grand Canyon because the sea level was rising too quickly. You'll see within what we call the Tapeat Sandstone and the Bright Angel Shale, you'll see a grading between the two that actually kind of shows that silt uh, change that occurs as sea level is changing in the area. So let's start with the oldest and we'll go to the youngest of the three. And then we'll talk about the significance of these three rock layers in their proximity to this stuff for right here. So this stuff right here is the Precambrian stuff, things like the Vishnu Schist, stuff that's really, really, really old. It's Precambrian basement rock. And then you see the squiggly line, and you know what that means from having done unconformities. That means we got some kind of major unconformity there. Since this is igneous and metamorphic rock, that unconformity would be called a nonconformity. Specifically, this is the Great Unconformity, the largest gap in geologic time discovered on Earth. Notice that directly above that sits the polka dotted one called the Tapeat Sandstone. And then you can see the Bright Angel Shale. So the Tapeat Sandstone would have represented the shoreline of the encroaching Salk Sea. And then the Bright Angel would have represented in exactly the same area of Arizona at the Grand Canyon. Sea level rose a bit. So we had lagoonal environments for a while. As it continued to rise, we got the mauve limestone, which would have represented far away from terrigenous input. So that means that we went from being right against the edge of the shoreline to being far enough from a terrigenous input to create limestone, all in the same area within the same geologic period. So sea level was moving along with the sock. So let's take a look at each of those rock layers and kind of put a story to them. You need to think of the Tapeat Sandstone as a beach deposit. So here's the Great Unconformity and here's the Tapeat Sandstone. It is a classic quartz-based sandstone. It unconformably overlies the Vishnu Schist, which there's a gap of about 1.2 billion. I said billion, not million, with a B. So that big gap is one of the most notorious places in the Grand Canyon because you can be hiking on the Bright Angel Trail, and for real, you're on that trail and you step off the Tapeat Sandstone right over that Great Unconformity into Precambrian aged rocks and you've stepped over 1.2 billion years of missing time in that rock record. So from Precambrian you should remember that that used to be a gigantic mountain range at the bottom of the Grand Canyon when Rodinia smashed and made a supercontinent and uplifted ginormous mountains in the middle of our continent. At that time that was the perimeter of our continent would have been the Arizona area. So Today, it seems like it's in the middle of the continent. It's really not. It's right where the edge was at that time. So we're missing about 1.2 billion years of history. However, you look at that in the schema stuff, that means we're missing 25% of the rock record's entire history in that one marker. What's amazing is, is how much history we have from this point forward to the top of the Grand Canyon and it's Paleozoic. From that white marker up, it's all Paleozoic stuff on at least the south and the north rim. If you go to the west rim, you can see some stuff that's much more modern. But we will be looking at the rock layers for Cambrian today. This is the characteristic of the Tapeat sandstone that was deposited by the Salk Sea. Your typical uh, flat laminated sandstones and this is the Bright Angel Trail right where you would be walking to the Great Unconformity. Matter of fact you're walking uphill here so that means you'd be coming from the Great Unconformity. Having uh, been on this trail I can tell you that these rocks look just like that. It's a pretty phenomenal experience to walk down to see this place. So what makes the Tapeat so famous besides the fact it sits above the Great Unconformity? It's a very mature, well-sorted, clean sandstone. Definition is needed here, I understand that. 
what does that really mean? Mature means that the sand grains have been washed around greatly, so most of them have the basic same shape. This is a magnified view. The Q stand for quartz grains. The C is calcite that uh, glues them together. And so while this may look fairly angular to you, these are actually pretty rounded sediments, even under a microscope. And so what happens is they're well sorted by size because the water of the surf has dramatically sorted them out by a graded bed. In other words, made these things, wash them clean, wash them to about the same size, and they've all been deposited in the same layer. That means long-term deposition along a shoreline was what a well mature sorted type of sandstone represents. Moving up, which means we're younger in geologic time in the Cambrian, is the Bright Angel Shale. I have a marker to the slope. And I need to point out, because here's the Tapete Sandstone right here. Here's the shale. Notice the shale makes a slope that looks more like this instead of a straight up and down unit that looks like this. Why is that? If you answer differential weathering, you are correct. So the higher the differential weathering, the faster the rock will weather. In this case, the Bright Angel Shale has a much higher differential weathering capacity as compared to the Tapete Sandstone. This is important for several reasons. Throughout the Grand Canyon, there's several layers that have this type of look to it. In other words, they have a uh, slope instead of a cliff face. That's because they weather faster. That also changes the width of the Grand Canyon formation by formation as you're going up throughout the Grand Canyon. That's why it can be 17 mile wide in one location and 10 miles wide in another. So it, it changes the rate of erosion and understand that the Bright Angel Shale is a much softer rock than the sandstone that sits beneath it. So what type of depositional environment does this represent? Lagoonal. So what kinds of animals live in lagoons today? Ask yourself that. If you don't know, you'll be learning a little bit later, but I'll help you out at this moment. Things like trilobites would have liked it. Things like clams and brachiopods, they would have loved it. So we're going to get those kinds of animals that appear in this type of environment right there. So sea level had risen in Arizona from being right at the shoreline for a while to make the tapetes sandstone to being perfect for creating a lagoonal rock known as the Bright Angel Shale. This is a look at what the character of that rock looks like. This is one of the stops that you can look at it at a major point in the Grand Canyon and they have samples of the rock for you to touch. And so this is one of the markers of the Bright Angel Shale. It's your typical soft shale unit. And so it should be weathering faster than the Tapete Sandstone. Directly above the Bright Angel Shale, so we went from Tapete to Bright Angel, now right above that, the youngest of the three in the Cambrian in the Grand Canyon is marked by the Mauve Limestone. You may be going, I think that's misspelled. That's the actual proper spelling of the geologic formation that I have there. The Mauve Limestone gets its name because it has very unique colors. And those colors uh, come from oxidation and minerals that have gotten into the grains of this carbonate rock. So this carbonate rock is limestone, which means it formed far away from a terrigenous input of sediment. So it has very small amounts of detrital material in it. So this, unlike the Tapete sandstone, um, you would not have been able to create this rock right next to the transcontinental arch. It would have been a long way from that shoreline. It would have been a deeper water environment because it has to be far away from a coastline. So you have to understand Arizona to Pete Sandstone used to be in the same geologic period, the shoreline. And we went from shoreline to lagoonal all the way to far away from a terrigenous input in such a short period of time. So that means the Salt Sea was growing at a very fast rate. Interesting to think about that because we got a perfect rock record that marks this incredible event that shows us that sea level really did change during the Cambrian period. So what does carbonate deposition look like? I took this out of a plane going to the Bahamas and I want you to notice this stuff right in here. That's classic carbonate deposition right there. Well here's the coastline. You get far enough away, usually 
carbonate deposition is further than the coastline from this, but the Bahamas has very small amounts of detrital material, so you can actually form limestone within even hundreds of, of yards away from some of the islands in the Bahamas, because this is a small one of the islands of the Bahamas, not the major one. And so when you're looking at that, just notice the white material that's what's going to end up making the limestone down the line. So when you're thinking carbonate depositional environment, think about this image right here, and it'll help you understand why and how the rocks were formed in that geologic condition. By the end of the Cambrian period, much of the North American craton was submerged beneath the Salk Sea. And the Salk Sea is an empiric sea. So to be clear, the first layer we laid down is the Tapeat Sandstone. And you can see some of that got weathered away. And then right above that is the Bright Angel Shale and then the Mauve Limestone. The three together are referred to as the Tonto Group. And if you get to the Grand Canyon and you can't find the names of these three layers, you're like, she lied. I didn't. They're called the Tonto Group. And so they're just a, a series of formations that have been grouped together. So where did they form? They're going to be forming right in this area right over here. So, and that's important to realize that the perfect conditions, you can kind of see where they weren't too far from the base of the transcontinental arch, and then you can see as sea level would have risen how it could have created far away from a terrigenous input of sediment to make the mauve limestone at the end. Now, while we're here, I would like to visit this story right here. Notice that the mauve limestone has an unconformable contact right here to the red wall limestone. And since they're parallel sedimentary rock layers, that makes that a disconformity. This is a big chunk of missing time right here, because take a look at this geologic period. Huh. That's Mississippian. And I know they're showing the mob limestone as this marker stopping at the Devonian, because there is a Devonian layer in one place of the Grand Canyon, but not in most of it. Clearly, these are all three Cambrian periods, and then we skip directly up to the Mississippian, so that means we're missing... Ordovician, Silurian, and Devonian rocks. And right above our Cambrian rocks, we have Mississippian rocks. This is one of the most prominent layers of the Grand Canyon because it makes a red ring all the way around it with a cliff face that's straight up and down. So it's an important rock layer to understand. While we're here, I'll point out that we get another group right here of sediments that we'll be looking at later that are Pennsylvanian in age and then the basal parts of the Permian. But the Permian makes up a big chunk of this flat sedimentary rocks that we have, certainly what caps the top of both the North and the South Rim, which is the Kaibab limestone, which is Permian in age. So really most of the Grand Canyon that we have exposed in terms of horizontal rocks are all from the Cambrian on up through the Permian periods, which constitutes the Paleozoic era. I haven't mentioned it yet, but I should by now, y'all should know what that symbol means. That means Cambrian. And most people want to put a C for Cambrian, but C is given to another geologic uh, period, which is the combined Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, known as the Carboniferous. So how many subdivisions of the Cambrian are there? If you're looking at divisions of time, we have uh, four epochs that make up the lower Cambrian, and there's a reason for that, because of the appearance of animals that came about in the Cambrian explosion, which was during the earlier lower Cambrian. And then we get the middle Cambrian, which is famous for the Burgess Shale, and then the upper Cambrian, which is a, one of the shorter segments of time, which represented this remarkable end to the Cambrian where we lost most of our trilobites when the Salk Sea began to regress off the continent. So let's talk about the early Cambrian. This segment lasted about 29 million years, and it's important because this is when we had the Cambrian explosion occur. So as Rodinia ripped it apart and Snowball Earth melted, this caused the Salk Sea to begin to rise and flood our craton, among other continents around the world. As this changed the chemistry of the ocean and subsequently the chemistry of the atmosphere, we got premium real estate right on continents for animals to flourish. Understand that trilobites are found worldwide. They are notorious because they are so widespread and so prolific from this time frame. 
So they're not the only guys to make their first appearance here. Marine predators did too. That's an important thing to note because as in the early Cambrian, quickly we get predators, which means animals are going to have to radiate, adaptive radiation, right? And they're going to have to learn how somehow to evolve to have better ways to protect themselves from predators. Well, Shelly fauna helped the Shelly animals do that very thing. So that's an, at least a hypothesis as to part of why we think that the Cambrian explosion occurred. So what is that Cambrian explosion? It represents a rapid diversification of animals with skeletons. I didn't mean necessarily phosphate-based skeletons, which we will see some of by the end of the Cambrian with our first fish. But I mean shelly skeletal material, where they mineralize, in other words, take minerals out of seawater and create their own shells. So that started somewhere around 530 million years ago. When we start seeing large skeletonized animals, that marks what we call the Cambrian explosion. So when you started to see animals that might have looked like this, well, this may be a cast, it's a cast of a mollusk, a bivalve in particular, these kinds of animals started to rapidly appear that were large, much larger than what we saw in Ediacaran fauna. The first exoskeleton is the marker that we have been using for over 100 years that describes the magic of what the Cambrian explosion was. Well, let's talk about the benefits of having this exterior benefit. What is an exoskeleton? That is the magic question about the Cambrian explosion. These are body exteriors that have been mineralized from seawater. So I'm not telling you we didn't have vertebrates yet. We will by the end of the Cambrian period when our first fish arrives. But these animals started building their own shells. Prior to this, they were soft-bodied animals. So a couple of major things happen that are some of the challenges that our animals are going to have to face as they try to move from water to land. And same thing with plants. So let's look at that now. As you have to imagine that these animals are crawling around in areas like Arizona that used not to be covered by an ocean, but they are today. And so the shallow marine habitat, you can get a serious sunburn from. And you, if you spend any time in somewhere like the Bahamas, you know that to be true. So having this extra benefit of protective cover is going to shield them from ultraviolet radiation in shallow marine environments. That's the very, very first thing, that most important hurdle that they overcame. Number two, they were able to prevent themselves from drying out by putting this coating on their outside of their body. In other words, making a shell. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but what if you're in a tidal flat and you're exposed for hours at a time? And so with a warming climate, that's important. So having this coating helped them from desiccating, which is drying out. Number three, as you get this shelly animal, it's going to allow them to have longer lifespans. So they'll be able to grow and mature. So that leads to increased body size. And the number four is the obvious. It helps them stay alive from predators. So if you look at these as a cumulative benefit package for these animals, this just gave them premium chances to fill niches in this new ecosystem that had been developed by the Sauk Sea, putting into the middle of the North American Craton all the way up to the Transcontinental Arch and the Canadian Shield. All of that is premium real estate that is freshly covered by this brand new ocean. So that means we got to put the fossils with the correct depositional environment. If you understand where the modern day animals live in an environment like this, like this is the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, then you're going to understand better why and how we classify fossils from geologic past. This information was covered in your textbook in this chapter for Paleozoic. But it's important enough for us to talk about here because it sets the framework for every animal we talk about, especially in the ocean, from this point forward. Let's discuss the specific areas where animals in the ocean would live so you can define them properly and understand the terms that we'll be using for the rest of the semester. Pelagic organisms are those that live in the water column. There's basically two broad categories that they fit into. 
Nectin, which would be your swimmers, like fish, and then your plankton-type animals, which are going to be your free-floating animals that float through the ocean water via currents. So that leaves one group of animals untouched that we've not talked about yet, which would be the benthos. Common term for benthos is benthic, and so let's look at benthic organisms and talk about the environments in which they live. Benthic organisms are those that live on the ocean floor. Now, they could also live in the ocean floor. So there's two different types. There's epifauna and infauna. Epifauna means they live on the ocean floor, crawl around on the ocean floor, live on the ocean floor, live on sediment. And then the infauna means they live in or throughout the sediment. They are like burrowers. Sessile organisms are those that live in one place on the seafloor. They don't get up and move. So they're attached to something they grow from one location. Mobile animals are those that actually have the capabilities to move around. So that determines, for example, many animals that fall in this category are going to be things like clams, things like brachiopods, things that don't have the ability to move. They're anchored to the substrate. But you get something like a crinoid, which you'll learn about. They can actually have these little feet that allow them to get up and move around, so they'd be mobile. So it makes a difference on which type of animal we're talking about as to which type of environment that they would live in. The marine food chain is very predictable in terms of how it works. It starts with sunlight providing energy necessary to make things like uh, dinoflagellates and radiolarians and diatoms, the ability to photosynthesize. So most of these are microscopic animals that are phytoplankton. They're things that float around in the ocean water, so they're pelagic, and then they're fed on by primary consumers. So the primary consumers are smaller animals that feed on these guys, and then the secondary consumers feed on the primary and then the tertiary uh, feed on the secondary consumers. There's one more category that's noteworthy and important because it adds actually importance to chemistry of the ocean and that's transformers and decomposers. You can't leave out the bacteria that break down everything. Sometimes we get an anoxic chemistry to the ocean and it can be because of these very guides. So they play a huge role when we're looking at certain mass extinctions that are thought to have been contributed to by a special type of decomposer where the, uh, where the ocean went anoxic and a bunch of these guys died. So understanding the food chain is important to understanding where these animals fall, where they live, the environments that you'd expect to find them in. I think this is a great place to take a break. We'll come back and we'll learn about the animals of the early Cambrian, then talk about the special fauna of the Burgess Shale, and then conclude with the end of the Cambrian period when we had a mass extinction event. See you back for the next half of the lecture. Bye.